Well, let me add my thanks to um, everyone here for uh, inviting us out to um, your beautiful state. Um, it's been a grand time getting to meet uh, many of you and seeing your hospitals and seeing um, what the effort that you've been putting into it. And hopefully this has been valuable for you. Um, as was said earlier in the day, I do have um, uh, one conflict to disclose. I do receive research support from Estellas through my institution. So, um, so the title of the talk was Caring for Patients with Emerging Infectious Diseases. And I've always found emerging infectious diseases a somewhat difficult topic to talk about because we can know what has recently emerged, but we don't know what's about to emerge. <laughs> And so you can only really talk about what are some of the serious things that we, could, we potentially face that we know about right now, and then put anything in the future into that framework um, in terms of taking care of it. And so these, this is directly from the federal select agent list. So we've talked about this a little bit. You know, notice that many of these are actually bacterial path pathogens that can be somewhat weaponized, but Ebola, Marburg, um, smallpox are both on there as well. Um, there are toxins that are there. Botulinum toxin um, made the list. There are others that have been used. There are other select agents that are under consideration. There are lots and lots of hemorrhagic fevers. There is Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Lhasa can be hemorrhagic. There's several South American hemorrhagic fevers. So Ebola emerged in 2013, 2014. It may be one of these that comes out of the jungles um, in 2018. Uh, we don't know. Um, and all we can do is plan for it. And then, of course, recently emerged viruses, MERS, chikungunya, and Zika. And um, I think that, you know, if we think about things that will probably uh, come out in the future, chances are it's going to be a virus. Um, it, you know, it maybe it's highly pathogenic H or influenza. Um, it may be one of those viruses I just mentioned, um, but uh, hopefully it won't be the, um, oh shoot, and the name just blanked out of my head, but it won't be like a kill, kill everyone type virus. So you've seen pictures of this. <laughs> <laughs> I like, yeah, <laughs> kill them all virus, I guess is what I should have said, yeah. Um, so the unit at Emory, um, you saw this in uh, Dr. Lowe's presentation. Um, this is uh, uh, our unit, it's not floating in space. This is a hallway that's right there. This is actually at the back end of an L shape or an inverted L, lambda, more of a lambda shape. Um, and uh, it's an 11 bed unit. Um, we actually have a third room that we could have used as our isolation room under negative pressure with an ante room that we could use as a warm zone or a cold zone. This is our lab, um, which is, you know, just 10 feet down the hallway. And this hallway sort of, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't dead end into nothing. Um, it actually is, uh, everything was controlled access, um, but the front door is controlled access from a public area. The back door is controlled access from a locked hallway, um, card key access only, and that is where our autoclave was, so our trash went down off the screen um, straight into the autoclave and then went to a staging area, which was a fairly sizable room that got filled up pretty quickly. I think if anything that you have realized in your planning, whether you're just beginning your planning or you are months um, and have a very robust plan for what would happen at your facility, is that it doesn't, it's not just one group of people. It takes a lot of people to make this happen. And so this is um, our team. This is sort of um, like the center of the team. Um, we had, at the time, critical care nurses only 19. We've uh, padded that up to 24. ID, our, our biosafety office was integral on part of this. Laboratory, materials management, um, environmental services, occupational um, and spiritual health. Uh, I didn't put facilities on here, but you know, alarms come on. Um, our unit has two negative pressure generators and it is programmed to cycle to the secondary unit on the weekend. 
And so at night on the weekend, we kept getting alarms because the secondary unit is about half the size of the primary unit. Um, and so uh, you know, thankfully, it's not an airborne issue for us, although the nurses don't like alarms. They like things to be quiet. And when the alarm kept going off and they didn't know what to do about it, that was very upsetting to them. Um, and I can understand why. But so, you know, it's important to have all these people and, you know, probably, I don't want to say key, but one group of folks that I left off this list is administration. Um, without their support, pretty much nothing happens. So these are some of the assumptions in terms of providing care that we had in our unit. Um, so we only had direct care providers that went into the patient room. And so for us, that meant the nurses, the five ID physicians. Um, we had uh, cardiac um, anesthesiologists, so the guys that did open heart surgery. Uh, they did our procedures for us, so placing central lines and intubating the patient. Um, and then we had one critical care person who um, was our physician while the rest of us actually were just up the street meeting the president one day. And something about meeting the president, there's a lot of security that goes with that. And it's not like when once we got onto the CDC campus and our patient went into AFib with rapid ventricular response that we could run back down the street to take care of them. Uh, Secret Service wouldn't even let us leave the room to go to the bathroom. So we were stuck and scrambling to try to get, make sure that he was getting taken care of. Um, and no, I'm not making that up. Um, and so we also, in terms of our team, we had had this in place for 12 years prior to actually accepting a patient. And no one went in the room without demonstrating competency with their PPE. Um, and so, you know, we actually had to exclude a couple of people who had been a members of the team for years on end because when it came time to doing PPE, they actually could not demonstrate competency. And a lot of that, if any of you have tried to get out of Tyvek, you know, there's this fair amount of dexterity that goes into wiggling out of your Tyvek suit without touching the outside of it. Um, you know, some of the things, and, and it's a different tack. Um, if you looked at Shelley's team, she has nurses from many disciplines. We tended to go with intensive care unit uh, nurses because we felt that they actually had a little bit more autonomy than maybe a med surge nurse or an ED nurse. Um, they could, with support from experts, do ventilator changes and management, um, ET tube management as well. Um, they were all familiar or quickly became familiar with our continuous renal replacement therapy or our dialysis therapy. So they could change the bags, they could keep it going, they could put new filters on, et cetera. Um, and, you know, they could do some other things like physical therapy, occupational therapy. And then everyone did environmental decontamination, not just nurses, physicians did it too. Um, no one is above uh, cleaning uh, or mopping the floor. Um, and one of the things that I think is important about this is that we had this culture of safety. Um, we, we felt that it was um, everyone's responsibility equally shared to uh, be safe and keep um, the environment safe for all of us that were in there. And so we had this, again, shared accountability. Um, we felt that communication is very key. We heard that earlier with Guam's experience that communication really um, caused some problems for them because people were communicating without clearing. Um, and so, um, you know, making sure that people were communicating effectively. Um, we had these rules, which I'm about to, to show you in a little bit, um, of our behavior that would govern uh, how we interacted and what we did. Um, and so there was effective communication about patient care. And every day at 7.15, so right around nurse change of shift, um, we would have a daily team huddle. And we actually set up um, not just a conference line, but it was a video conference line, so people could video conference in if they wanted to. Um, and, but we had a duplicate phone line that was there so that everyone, whether they were working that day or not, could call in and participate in the daily team huddle. And so the people that had been on the night before would give a quick clinical update um, and then we would outline what's the schedule for the patient going to be, what's going to happen today, what are our goals that are going to be happen today. And so everyone, including administration, physicians, nurses, uh, ancillary folk people, were all on board and knew what the plan for the day was. Oops, I just told you that. Um, <laughs> uh, 
And so then we went over the family rules at the end of all those conferences, and these are our family rules. Um, obviously, follow all the standard operating procedures as best as you can. Make sure that your fellow workers do the same thing. So we were all watching out. We would all tattle, if you want to call it that, on our siblings, our family. Um, but we weren't really tattling. We were just trying to keep them safe, too. Um, any accidents that came, and it's not because then we would place blame, but we would look at our process and say, all right, did this accident happen because the process is wrong? Is there an engineering control or environmental control that we can put in place? How do we need to change our process in order to uh, avoid this accident or near miss in the future? Um, we found it important to know about symptoms. Sometimes symptoms wouldn't be communicated back to the physician um, or it might get lost in some other sort of communication. It might be delayed, um, like a few hours if the nurse didn't feel it was important. So we really wanted people to tell us when any, any time something happened, um, if it were a new symptom um, or any medical condition that, which was new that came up. So the schedule was very important. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's nice, um, but it's very, it was important to make, to make sure that we, that we had, you know, when is the physician going into the room? When are the blood draws going to happen? Um, when can the family come visit? Uh, because we would have them actually come into our ante room so that they could look at the patient through the, the window and talk to them on the phone. Um, and so you, in a confined space, you don't want to get too many bodies in there because then you start bumping into each other. Um, and once you start bumping into it, you actually spill things, you trip, et cetera. And so it had to be very coordinated and orchestrated to make sure that um, things went smoothly. Um, and so after we had our team huddle, um, whenever the family would show up, that would be, we would also discuss with them um, what the schedule for the day was going to be. And so, you know, these are some of the standard operating procedures that we had. Um, you know, it, it's nice to have its consistency. You do it the same way every time, so you get very good at it. Um, there was also flexibility if something went a little awry. Staff, nursing staff, physician staff were unable to sort of step outside of the standard operating procedures. Obviously, we're all bright and intelligent people, and we can think on the fly if need, need be. And it also gives a lot of confidence in that you know what you're doing because you've done it so many times in that way. So, you know, we had these, these are things that you've done. We've donning and doffing, buddies, waste management. You've heard about all these. They're very similar um, with sort of minor detail or differences from uh, what has just been shown from Nebraska. And I think that uh, we've said it time and again that you can go to needtech.org and you can find our protocols. Um, and you can download them and use them, but you should modify them to your unique situation because we can't be proscriptive. Um, we can't tell you how and exactly that you need to do it because you don't have everything that we have um, and that things are different. And so it just has to be adapted to your specific situation. Um, you know, here's the ad not, the list goes on. I'm not going to tell you about each one of these. Um, but there are standard operating procedures for everything. And so there's this guy named Atul Gawande, I think is his last name, um, who is a physician, is a surgeon in Boston. And he writes a lot of books about medical practice and, and what, the way we should change things. But one of the things that he wrote several years ago was a book called The Checklist Manifesto. And he, he, looks, he uh, extrapolated from two... Um, uh, non-medical careers or industries. One was construction, and I don't mean constructing a house, but constructing a skyscraper. Um, and the other was actually pilots. And so they have um, checklists for everything that has to happen. So for construction, you know, you can't build a building and do everything and then go back and put the plumbing in. You know, the plumbing has to go in in a coordinated fashion with the heating and air and the concrete and the siding, et cetera. The same thing for pilots. So for pilots, though, you know, things go wrong. Um, and if something goes wrong, you have this, this flip book where you flip, you, you, know, you know what you've got wrong, you find what it is that has gone wrong, and then you have this checklist of procedures you go through to correct that mistake um, and to get your plane working again so that you can then fly. And so that's a lot of what these standard operating procedures are. They're checklists, um, and it's just a way to do things so that it gets done in a consistent manner and nothing gets missed. 
So nurses are um, amazing people. Hats off to all of you nurses here in the room. Um, you make doctors look good. Um, <laughs> so nurses obviously uh, provide, you know, having the ICU nurses allowed us to provide a high level of nursing care and supportive care. And I'm gonna come back to supportive care in a minute. Um, we had 24 seven one-on-one -on -one nursing. Um, there's nowhere else in the world except maybe with your mom that you get 24 seven one-on-one -on -one nursing. Um, that allowed us to actually, since that nurse was always at the bedside, there was a rapid response to any change in condition of the patient. Um, that allowed them to be intimately involved in all supports that the patient needed, nutrition, physical therapy, self-care, toileting, et cetera. Um, and um, they could also provide emotional support. And so Dr. Brantley, not the first night he was there, because that was kind of a rocky night, but the second night he was there, and I think this is actually in his book, so I'm not disclosing anything that I shouldn't, um, he woke up in the middle of the night and he looked over and he saw that there was someone sitting there and he said that was so reassuring to him because for the four or five days before he came back to the United States, he was all alone. Um, he, you know, he was the only one who was taking care of himself, drinking, et cetera. Um, yes, yeah, someone would come and sort of check on him once a day, but he was by himself for the majority of the day. And so just to have, just to know that that presence was there was very comforting for him, and he actually rolled over and went back to sleep and felt much better. And the nurses were great because when they weren't at the, be the bedside, they were actually out communicating with the family, giving messages to the family, and giving updates on how things were going. And so, um, you know, I, nurses were incredibly important for the smooth running of our unit and for every unit every day um, in every hospital across this country. So, patient evaluation. Um, it, this is um, something interesting, and so um, I'm actually going to take an aside here and say um, that uh, when I was a medical student, a third year medical student in the surgical rotation, the surgeons taught me the rules of medicine. Um, and so there were several rules in medicine, and one of them was sleep when you can, um, uh, don't sit when you can lie, don't stand when you can sit and don't insert your favorite explicative with the pancreas. Um, and so <laughs> then when I was an intern, my attending you know, took us, he went through that as well, and he said, there are, there are some additional um, rules that I want you to follow. He said, uh, um, wash your hands before you go to the bathroom, and if you don't want it, don't touch it. And essentially, personal protective equipment is that last rule. If you don't want it, then don't touch it. Um, and so that's the barrier that we put on so that we don't touch anything. And so with all that um, PPE that you've seen, whether it's, it's face masks and N95s or a PAPR, um, with a wet patient, there's nothing exposed. So everything is covered up, and that is the safest thing. However, that creates a little bit of a problem because we don't always examine patients in full PPE. That's just not the way we do it. That's not the way we're taught. And so in terms of how does this affect or alter what you do, so if you're palpating a patient, you actually have an extra layer, at least an extra layer of gloves on. Um, we do wear gloves all the time, but that second layer of gloves can actually change the way things feel. Many people have in place protocols where there's a third pair of gloves. Um, I find that personally to be overkill, um, and it really diminishes your tactile and palpable palpation um, skills. So in terms of inspection, or just looking at something, that is actually all, can be altered as well. So plastic is not glass, it's often curved, um, and so it can distort what we see. Thankfully, it doesn't distort it to the extent that we don't know what it is. However, if you're wearing goggles, goggles can get foggy. And so in one of the displays I think we've seen over the last couple of days, there was a picture of someone who had goggles and an N95 on, and the goggles were completely fogged over. Um, so if you get into that situation, there's really not a whole lot that you can do to unfog them because you don't want to take your contaminated hands and reach up to your face and, and do that. So, um, and then, the, but the, I think the biggest barrier to our usual physical examination skills is auscultation. So 
you've got your head covered with something that is either Tyvek or Tycam, and you can't put your usual stethoscope into your ears without some sort of layer of fabric in between there. And so it, it takes a little bit of a challenge, and I think that one of the things um, that I would say is this is the one exception to the rules that I teach medical students is, is to allow technology to assist you. A lot of times medical students get caught up on what the monitor says and forget to look at their patient and see what their patient is doing. But here, it, you, you know, having a bedside monitor is important. And so the folks at, at Nebraska um, use this, and we use this as well. Again, no endorsement implied. Um, but this is a um, electronic stethoscope. And it is, uh, there is a little port here for, as you can see, a headphone jack. And so this is a setup for us that we could use to transmit this across or outside of the room so it could be played on a speaker and recorded simultaneously so that it could be then emailed somewhere if someone needed to listen to it. But instead of doing this Bluetooth, uh, hookup, which is what these two little things are, is Bluetooth, you can put earbuds into this and it works similar to a regular stethoscope. And so you put your earbuds in first, you snake the cord out, and then you plug that into the, into the um, electronic stethoscope. You do what you need to do in terms of auscultation. When you're finished auscultating, you then pull your earbuds out. The earbuds are disposable, they get trashed, and then you can wipe this off um, with any cleaning agent that you, you wish. It can't be dumped, but it can be cleaned with anything. And so this is actually a reasonable substitute to a traditional stethoscope. Um, as I think I said, at least in my experience, in one place you can hear heart sounds. You're not gonna pick up a grade one or grade two murmur for that matter. And you can hear breath sounds, but subtle things may not necessarily, or don't come across on the stethoscope. Um, and so some of the other technological things that we have, um, at least they don't seem like huge advances now, but you know this bedside monitor so that we can monitor heart rate, pulse, pulse ox, um, respiratory rate, et cetera, is very important because if you can't actually hear the lung sounds, at least looking at the patient and seeing their chest go up and down and seeing that their oxygen saturation is in the 90s is a good thing. Um, you can see other than that, this is a relatively simple patient room. It looks like just about any patient room um, elsewhere in the United States, um, and this is all, where all the medical gases come out. We do have a diagnostic um, kit on the wall, although it didn't, I mean, we used it for a light source. That was about the only thing. We didn't do fundoscopic exams through our, our uh, plastic uh, goggles. So, so a little bit about how we treated the patient. And, um, you know, in thinking about this, and I've actually given this portion of the talk many times, um, but you know, essentially what we did was we did supportive care. And a lot of medicine is supportive care, it's just that. Um, and we support the person until they can actually heal themselves. Now, we do give antibiotics to cure pneumonias, we do use little balloons that are snaked up catheters to open up blocked arteries, but there is still a large part of support that goes into that, so we can make some corrections. So that's essentially what we have done with Ebola virus disease and probably any emerging infectious disease that will come is we will support the patient until they can get through the illness on their own. Um, and it may include life support. So this is, um, this is from um, our friends at CDC. And uh, this is a comparison between the signs and symptoms of Ebola and non-Ebola, which was done in, during one of the earlier um, outbreaks in Africa. And so I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger so it's a little bit easier to read. Um, and you can see that there is some diarrhea. It doesn't necessarily mean it's Ebola versus non-Ebola. Um, you know, but really Ebola is like many infections. It has sort of a common endpoint, which is a lot of symptoms, including fever. And so it may be difficult, especially in a setting like Africa, where there are a lot of infectious illnesses that present to a, a clinic or a hospital, to distinguish Ebola up front from something else. But if you have known Ebola, um, this is kind of the sequence that happens with uh, Ebola virus disease. And so what you see is actually a fairly prolonged fever. It can last um, almost up to two weeks. Early in the illness, there are things like myalgias, chills, and headache. 
which could be influenza, it could be malaria, it could be Ebola, it could be loss of fever, it could be any number of things. Um, and even so, up until almost the end of the first week, things are not very uh, unique to this particular disease. Um, later, it moves into the gastrointestinal phase with abdominal pain, diarrhea, a little bit of vomiting. Vomiting is actually not uh, very prominent. But the diarrhea is really a very prominent. Some people get a rash, a petechial rash. Some actually, some of our patients had a viral rash as well. Um, and then you can see some loss in urine output. This may be from hypovolemia because of the gastrointestinal sy sy symptoms. And then finally, you can get multi-organ failure and death and sort of a sepsis-like picture. And that can come anywhere along the line. So again, our clinical care is really supportive care. There are no proven therapies to treat Ebola. Um, there are lots of things that have been tried, and we have been guilty of trying them in one-offs and then saying that we did this and this is what happened, but nothing has been proven in a randomized clinical trial to be effective. Um, and so many of the, the um, agents that are out there have limited safety and almost no efficacy data. But again, we did, we did try these in an attempt to get some signal of whether they would be effective or at least that they would be safe. And so we're left with supportive care, and that includes fluid management, electrolyte replacement, and life support if needed. <clears throat> and so in order to achieve that, we had to have you know, our consulting physicians that were available. Um, you know, I'm an infectious disease physician. The other primary people were infectious disease physicians as well. Um, it's been... Let me think about this. It's been about 17 years since I finished my residency in internal medicine. Dr. Ribner, it's been, I don't know, 40 years since he finished his residency in internal medicine. Some of the younger people have been a little. And so some of these other things like nephrology and renal um, uh, you know, pathology, is a, it's a little rusty and so we didn't necessarily have it. So we had our consultants and it is important to identify those people up front. And so this is one of the things that we ran into, and this is one of our patients, and this is their fluid balance. And so positive fluids going in are above that, that horizontal line, primarily in yellow, and then fluids coming out are below that horizontal line, and then um, the deeper the, uh, the bar, then um, the more fluids out, obviously. And this uh, triangle connected line is the net balance uh, for that day. And so this is uh, our patient who arrived on day three. And so you can see here that by um, the around, stop it, um, the, uh, around the first week or so, around day seven of illness is where these purples um, start coming out. And you can really see that there is dramatic fluid losses in, in the form of diarrhea. So all of this purple is actually diarrhea. This is about eight plus liters, almost nine liters out um, down here. And so, you know, if you can imagine drinking like five two liter bottles of Coca Cola, I'm from Atlanta, so it's Coca Cola, um, then, you know, it, it, you can't orally replace that volume loss um, because Ebola is like having the flu on steroids. Um, you can, it's hard enough to roll over in bed just to pick up the glass, let alone take in those 10 liters that you try to would need to take in in order to keep up with the fluid loss. Um, and so this, this is um, you know, another patient, and again, sorry, I have to look at the, um, and fortunately, this is a, a lot of uh, um, urine loss, or urine that comes out, and this is later in the illness, and I mentioned in our breakout session that uh, there's a sepsis uh, uh, phenomenon that happens and you get a lot of this third spacing of the fluid no matter what you do. And so um, they, they tend to get volume overloaded, um, not in their vascular, but just sort of in their body in general. And what we found was this dramatic phenomenon that is that within days, as the sepsis part uh, finished, then they had this massive diure diuresis. And so two of our patients actually lost 10 kilos, yes, 10 kilos, in about a 36 to 48 hour period when they hit that phase. And it was, it was amazing to look at. Um, and uh, this, this is again over time in one of our patients and you can see that there's this large amount of diarrhea that is coming out because this maroon is, is uh, 
um, diarrhea. And this is our patient that actually developed renal failure. There's the urine, which is starting to go away. And then we started him on CERT. Um, and uh, this is the output that uh, he got in the first few days on, on dialysis. And this just continues. And of course, the, sorry, there's a color change, but the orange, the orange or the line below is, again, dialysis output. Um, and then finally, here towards the end, the kidneys are starting to work again. Um, and eventually, they, they do kick in. And that's what this urine, uh, the red out here is the urine coming back in. So, you know, fluid management, electrolyte management, is the big part of managing someone, at least with Ebola virus disease. And so speaking of electrolytes, this is what we published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but these are, these are our, the first patient who came in. And one thing that we noticed across the board was that all of our patients had hypocalcemia. If, even if you corrected for a low albumin, they were still hypocalcemic. Um, this patient actually was, uh, had a low potassium as well. Um, some of that may have been just because we started to fluid resuscitate him. We diluted out what potassium he had. In those first 48 hours, he was actually throwing some frequent PVCs, and we were really worried he might get into a fatal tachyarrhythmia. Um, these are the liver function abnormalities that we saw. And there's really not a whole lot to do about this, but um, the hallmark, again, is that AST is out of proportion to ALT, and so when we got him, his AST was way up here. Um, and there was some thrombocytopenia, um, but that actually improved without us needing to make any intervention. You can see hemoglobin was relatively stable across uh, the duration of his hospitalization, and he came in with a leukocytosis that fixed itself over time. Um, our second patient, um, same thing. Um, she was dehydrated, so we have volume resuscitated her. Within uh, a short period of time, she became hypocalcemic as well. Um, she actually came in hypokalemic, and so we needed to fix that. Um, and you can see the albumin is very low. In terms of liver abnormalities, she too had a low or had a high AST, which was well above the ALT. And then this alkaline phosphatase, and the scale is very different here, gets way up to almost 1,000. Um, and we felt that this might be, in some part, just a, a response to the calcium as well. Um, and here, this is the patient that actually got a transfusion got pretty low, uh, right around 30,000, just below 30,000. Just got the single transfusion and then came back up. Again, a leukocytosis, which improved over time. So these are just some of the things that we saw. Again, the impact of the electrolytes. We saw marked electrolyte abnormalities, primarily hypocalcemia and hypokalemia. Um, we worked to fix those in conjunction with volume resuscitation. We were really worried and we hypothesized when we got our patients and we found this, that some of the unexpected deaths that were being seen in West Africa may be from um, um, arrhythmias because of the electrolyte imbalances that were so far out of whack, especially the, pota or the potassium and the calcium as well. Um, we used both IV and oral replacement, but you know, vomiting um, was prominent when they first came in and oral replacement was not really uh, feasible um, in that time. Uh, but once the vomiting stopped, we, we did encourage them to, um, to take in oral um, replacement fluids and nutrition as much as possible. Um, Dr. Brantley, again, and his, his is in his book, but you know, as soon as he stopped vomiting, he thought he was uh, that much better, um, the naivety of youth. Um, so he asked his wife to bring him some Chick-fil-A, another fine Atlanta institution. <laughs> and as soon as he finished his chicken sandwich, he immediately regretted it. Um, his words, not ours. Um, so uh, yeah, you have to stick with the brat diet for a little bit of time. <laughs> but what we really felt was that, you know, knowing what our, our laboratory values, the chemistries, et cetera, were, were, was really critical in being able to provide supportive care to our patients and making sure that they didn't get into too much trouble while they were at the, at the height of their illness. So we, as was shown in Dr. Lowe's, we did monitor virologic status. We do think that this actually has some bearing on recovery. Um, and so CDC did that for us for the most part. And this is sort of the viral curve that we saw. That's the solid line and purple, at least it looks purple to me, um, that is here, and you can see, 
um, these bar graphs are actually the antibodies that are coming up. And so IgM and IgG, and you can see that they come up pretty early. And when they do that, that's when the viral load starts to go down. This decline in viral load is associated with a resolution in fever and also with uh, a slowing down of the diarrhea or um, improvement in the gastrointestinal phase. And so I mentioned that supportive therapy is really this is what we need to do. These are the experimental therapies which have been tried um, in this outbreak and have been studied as well. So convalescent plasma, we did that with many of our patients. Um, so hyperimmune globulin from an immunized animal or a previously infected human. So that's essentially what kind of what ZMAP is. So ZMAP's a cocktail of three an um, antibodies um, against uh, targeting the GP protein, which is an envelope protein. So TK TKM, uh, Ebola, or Tecmira is the company. Um, this is a small interfering RNA. Um, it has uh, some side effects, um, and these were picked up actually in a signal in their phase one safety studies. And we used it in two of our patients, and they had the same side effects. And so I'm not so sure. I mean, these side effects are actually pretty significant. I'm not sure that that's something that I would reach for. Um, page two, um, some small molecule, um, uh, you know, a small oligonucleotide. Favipiravir is actually probably a good drug. At least we think so. It's effective for influenza. Um, and it is uh, from a Japanese company. Um, BCX4430 is actually a broadly acting antiviral. Um, it is about to enter into phase two studies, and so um, we may see more animal data and vitro data coming out about its efficacy against um, um, Ebola, but I think it'll probably be brought to market for something else, um, but it is a very good antiviral against a number of viruses. Brincidofavir was on the short list for a long time. And it actually has very, it doesn't have any efficacy in uh, animal data. Um, it was used in four patients, but um, their mortality was actually higher than the controls, but not statistically so. So what about prevention? And I think this is maybe what makes uh, Ebola less of a concern in the future, is there are two very good vaccines that are out there. Um, and they do appear to work um, with anywhere from 75 to 100 percent efficacy. So there's a chimpan chimpanzee adenovirus, um, and you know, that actually works pretty well, and then a recombinant vesicular stomatitis virus. Um, and both of these actually have you know, vaccine-related side effects, which is primarily fever, because they're live viruses. Um, and so you get a febrile response. Um, but you know, one of the, I'm blanking, I think it was the, the VSV virus was used in sort of a ring vaccination strategy in West Africa. And this was an interesting um, study design uh, because they felt that uh, placebo controls would actually be unfavorable or, or not uh, acceptable to the population in West Africa. And so what they did was they, they randomized in a group fashion, so cluster fashion, they randomized to immediate vaccination versus vaccination at 21 days after exposure. Well, 21 days is the outside of the incubation period, so that's probably an, a placebo intervention, to be honest. But what they found was there was at least 75% efficacy. Uh, or that was the low side of the confidence bounds in terms of uh, that uh, in preventing Ebola virus. So hopefully that actually is available for emergency use, if not actually marketed at some point. So some of the conclusions from our, our experience is that uh, you can take care of patients with Ebola. You can do it safely. It takes a lot of prior planning, and that's what we're here for. Um, in the United States, and actually in Western Europe as well, the mortality rates were quite a bit lower. My guess is, is that um, if we had Ebola in a um, first world country, that the mortality rate would probably be between 10 and 20%. It actually wound up being 40% in West Africa, even with all the limitations that they have in West Africa. Um, we still need to learn a lot about how we can manage uh, patients, um, and communication is incredibly critical. Um, there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen. We saw that with Dr. Lowe's uh, presentation, that, that co coordination and communication between different agencies and, and groups is very important and that it needs to be comprehensive in terms of patient care, 
comprehensive, multidisciplinary, and family-centered so that we can deliver the best care that we can. So since I'm not talking just about Ebola, there are other agents. The good news is, is that most of the other agents that are on the select agent list um, do are bacterial. And so this is looking at anthrax, and weaponized anthrax was for years a uh, concern. Um, this is primate data from the 90s, and you can use in any number of antibiotics to treat anthrax, uh, but in terms of uh, looking at survival after rechallenge, and anthrax does survive in the environment for quite some time, um, years actually, uh, doxycycline plus, plus vaccination um, leads to the best long-term um, survival at least in these monkeys. You can see that vaccination alone is not very good for preventing uh, disease, and placebo certainly doesn't do much of anything. So in terms of the treatment options, we have penicillin, doxycycline, and ciprofloxacin. Uh, there is an experimental therapy in terms of immunoglobulin against anthrax. Um, botulism is another one of those things where it's largely supportive. Um, there is an antitoxin, but it's not widely available, and you have to call our federal friends to get it. And being out here in the middle of the Pacific, something tells me it might take a while to get to you. Um, so there are some vaccines that are there, um, but again, not uh, um, you know, no one's going to get routinely vaccinated against botulism. So plague is another one of those things we heard coming out of our uh, from Dr. Bell from the groundhogs, um, and uh, it is manageable. Um, some of the antibiotics have some side effects that are there. Um, we hardly ever use chloramphenicol in the United States, but it is still available in IV formulation. But what about those things that we don't know about or are going to emerge? As I said at the beginning, we don't necessarily know exactly what they are. Um, in my opinion, at least, they're most likely to be viral, um, and they probably won't have an effective vaccine. You know, we're, we're estimating it'll take 10 years before we have a Zika vaccine. Um, we may not be able to generate an effective vaccine ever. We're still working on HIV, and uh, we're getting closer, but we don't have an effective HIV vaccine. We may have effective antivirals, so we have pre-existing things that can be used, but we'll need to know that testing, you know, that they're efficacious. Lamivudine, or 3TC, or Epivir, is a good HIV hepatitis B drug. It's been used for years in the United States, and it works great on that RNA virus known as HIV. It doesn't work very well on that RNA virus known as Ebola. It was tried for, for Ebola, and there was a news magazine, I don't remember whether it was CNN or Dateline, that uh, went to West Africa and found a doctor that used it in a number of patients, all of whom apparently lived. But, you know, Lamivid, you, so it's hard to know. We may have drugs that work, we may not have drugs that work. Um, but the good news is, is it probably won't create zombies. Um, but, uh, you know, um, it is fun. I wish I had a crystal ball and I could predict what the next pandemic or outbreak would be, but I don't. Um, so, good, I met my objective, which was not to have Dr. Park walk around and give me the time limit. <laughs> 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 so.